My name is Ajamal Bailey. I'm the chair of the Moore Board of Directors, and Moore is moving to Omaha for race equity. And uh, one of our missions uh, that we work on is anti-racism and try to bring the community together to deal with reconciliation and issues uh, related to helping our community to grow. Uh, today we have with us um, uh, uh, Wayne, uh, Chief Deputy Sheriff Wayne Hudson. And one of the things I always start off with, I always say to the to the viewer and audience is welcome to our show, obviously. And again, we're going to talk about these issues that hopefully help us inform as more as bring a community to these different circles. Uh, Chief Deputy Sheriff Wayne Hudson has been very much involved in many activities. He's been with the Douglas County Sheriff Department for 26 years, which I didn't know that. And is widely known in the community for his understanding of challenges that affect many people of color. Uh, and particularly in Douglas County. Wayne was raised in Omaha and has a litany of college degrees and university degrees and so on. He's been married for 22 years and has three children. And so I wanted to give him a chance. First, De uh, Chief Deputy Sheriff Hudson, can you tell the viewers a little bit more about yourself? Yep. First of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, born and raised right here in this community. Grew up at 28th and Laurel. Uh, we actually still own the home there. Graduated from high school in 1986 from Northwest High School. I um, left high school not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life. God blessed me would let me have a neighbor next door who was in the Air Force. So two weeks after high school, I'm on a plane to San Antonio, San Antonio Texas for basic training. So I spent from 1986 to 1992 in the United States Air Force, honorably discharged in 92, came back to Omaha, went to Wayne State College from 92 to 94, graduated in 94. When I came back to Omaha, my department wasn't hiring right away, but we did at that time have what's called a reserve deputy program, which is you help the law enforcement officers in their day-to-day -day duties. So I joined that and did that for a year and then got on full-time in 95. I knew at that time that I wanted to do something different than just doing patrol. I wanted to make a difference. And I felt that the way to do that is to work my way up through the ranks to try to get into a position where I can make change. But at the same time, I started working and doing a lot of community service. So in 98, um, I received my master's degree and I got promoted to sergeant. In 2006, I got promoted to lieutenant. And then 2013, I got promoted to captain. And then in 2020, Sheriff Dunning retired with two years left on his term. Um, the county board appointed Tom Wheeler as the interim sheriff, and he appointed me as his second in command. So as the chief deputy sheriff, I run the day-to-day -day operations of the sheriff's office in cooperation with my captain. So we have six bureaus. Five of the bureaus are headed by a captain and the sixth bureau is headed by a lab director. All those individuals report to me and we run the sheriff's office. We have approximately 220 personnel with about a $19.5 million budget. So we have full law enforcement services throughout Douglas County. Our primary patrol zone, which a lot of people don't understand, I have the third largest patrol zone in the state of Nebraska at about 95,000 population that are outside of any city limit or village. So again, married, um, I go to Salem Baptist Church. I'm an avid hunter. I love to get out in the woods and hunt. I love to fish, I'm an outdoorsman. So, and one of the biggest things I love doing is giving back to the community. And, I, and people ask me, why am I running for sheriff? It's a simple reason. To me, it's simple. I love this community and I love this profession, okay? I know this profession hasn't always been on the right side of history. You can look back um, and back at the civil rights era, you can see the, the Bull Connor and the dogs, things of that nature. We haven't always been on the right side of history. Along with our weed and seed and zero tolerance, those programs, what we did back then was we told the community what they we felt they should have instead of involving the community. Well, we find out now that didn't work. That's why you see a lot of community engagement, um, a lot of you know trying to get in tune with the community. So I love this community. I love this profession, and I know at the at the position of sheriff, I can have a greater impact on bridging the gap between the two. Good. Yeah. Well, I know that you ran for office against two members of Omaha Police Department. How difficult is that for someone who's worked for years in Omaha Police Department to move into the culture of the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, particularly what you just described? Well, actually, there's actually three. Uh, there's a one person that jumped in at the last minute. Um, it's 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 going to be difficult because although we're both law enforcement agencies, 
there are certain state statute requirements that the sheriff has that the police department doesn't have. For example, we have court security, we have civil process, civil proceeds, uh, warrants. We have those, those type of uh, entities and divisions that as you were a, uh, I'm a police officer, you would have never worked those areas. So with me, I have either worked, supervised or managed every area within the sheriff's office. Yeah, it, it'll be kind of difficult, especially for some, two of the candidates are lower rank. So let me say it like this. In any law enforcement agency, you have a hierarchy of rank. The basic level is either an officer or a deputy. Then your first level of supervisor is a sergeant. Well, one individual that's running for sheriff is a sergeant. Typically, a sergeant is someone that supervises personnel. They don't dealing with budgets. They're not dealing with um, uh, policies and procedures, just supervision of a shift. So that's one person. The next level, mid-level mid management is a lieutenant. And there's one individual that's uh, running that's a lieutenant. Uh, well, he wasn't, he's retired now. That's where you're in charge of a division. So you may have a couple shifts or you may have like your homicide division, um, your warrants division. The next level up is a captain. The captain's in charge of a bureau. So like we have, like I said, we have five bureaus. Then the one above that is chief deputy on my department. On Omaha police is deputy chief. And then Omaha police has an assistant chief. So my position, if it's equivalent to Omaha police would be assistant chief to the sheriff. Gotcha. Now in the African community, it's rare to see county sheriffs uh, in the community, except I know that you've been active in participating in those 360 meetings. And also my question is, where are your colleagues in those meetings? I have not seen a lot of the folks who's running for office in 360, which people know about that. Also explain where is your work areas? In other words, you talked about the administrative structure, but where do you actually work at in this city? And then obviously that relates to your own police department. How do you guys not step on each other's toes? So it's like a three-part question there. Yep, very good. Um, where my colleagues are at on those meetings, I, I, I don't see them. Um, I know that I think um, one of them that's still on the police department now, he would show up from time to time. Um, the other two, they're no longer with the agency. They abruptly left the agency. So even though they still can attend the Yumhall 360 meetings, but I don't know, I, I, that's where, to me, you have to be intentional. If you want to do it, you have to intentionally, you know, uh, zoom in and have input on what's going on in the community. Now, as far as um, uh, in the community and what I do, um, yes, I've been very involved in the community and, and I've been doing this for over 20 years because I know that I can make a greater impact. We, you're right, we don't see that many sheriffs in North Omaha or South Omaha. And I can tell you right now, that was a huge mistake on our part because for years, when we talked about community engagement, we only engaged in Western Douglas County because there was no emphasis at that time on diversifying the agency, okay? And I know we're gonna talk about the rules of that, but there was no emphasis on that. Now, we are a nationally accredited agency through CALEA. We have one of the top um, certifications in the nation. Only 3% of the agencies in the United States have that certification that we have. Well, one of the standards for our accreditation says, if your department does not reflect the community based on the latest census, then you must have a robust uh, recruitment plan. So our department, we don't reflect at all. So what are we doing? We have a robust plan. And part of that plan is getting our brand, getting our information into those communities of color so that they know that we are open for business. We want individuals there. Well, we can't just say it. We have to show it. We have to go into the community. We have to be active in the community. We have to be part of the community. And the only way we can do that is by attending functions, holding forums, getting to know the community. So that's what I've been a, putting a big emphasis on since I took over as captain and now as chief deputy. So now you see it. When I took over as a captain on patrol, it was the first time, first time we ever was in the Cinco de Mayo parade, was in a Juneteenth parade, again, we have to show the department 
the, excuse me, the county that we are a transparent agency. We want everyone to apply. This last testing cycle, well, the one prior to this, our numbers were still low. And it's tough trying to get minorities to apply for the department. But then when I'm looking at the numbers, the numbers passing the test, getting to the interview were extremely low. So I took our recruitment plan. I sat down with my admin captain and the admin lieutenant. I said, time out. We've been doing this way for the longest time. It's not working. We have to find a better way to recruit individuals to our agency. I said, so let's take a hard look at this. We know we're looking for minorities. We know we're looking for females. So how can we do a better job? First thing I did was double the budget when it comes to uh, recruitment activities, double the budget. We advertised on MAP buses. We, uh, we sent information to churches. We sent information to different groups that we can get out to the minority community. And then what we did was we said, you know what? We need help with this test. We hired a minority consultant firm. They looked at our test and they came up with a test prep and interview prep. And we sent that out to everyone. And we, we encouraged minorities and females to apply and go through, the, go through the process. I'm happy to say during our last testing process, 50%, 50% of the end of people that we're looking at right now are minorities or females. Wow. So again, if you're intentional, it works but you have to be intentional. You have to have someone in the seat like this that really understands and respect diversity. Right, got you. Um, in recent years, law enforcement has come under a great deal of scrutiny uh, related to the challenge after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. What has changed from your perspective in terms of law enforcement? I'm looking at kind of like at a big picture, uh, 60,000 feet level versus a 30,000 feet level, or you can go with both. But what has changed from your perspective? Well, I can tell you right now from our perspective is that with George Floyd, the one thing I have to say about that one is that was the first time that I saw something um, in the law enforcement community. Typically, when something happens in another agency, law enforcement, we don't criticize another agency. We, you know, that happened there. We don't want you criticizing me, so I'm not going to criticize you. What I saw on that one was was a nationwide criticism of what happened there. Everyone knew that was wrong. Everyone knew that was wrong. So then for us as a law enforcement executives, it had forced us to take a hard look at our policies and procedures. For example, do we have a duty to intervene? If you see a law enforcement officer doing something that is wrong against policy and procedures, do we have a duty to intervene? We have to tweak our policy some to make it a little bit more strict so that we make sure that in a situation like that, our deputies know exactly what to do and they act. So that was one. The other thing I think that- oh, Hold on just a second, a little clarity there. Are yeah. you saying in the past, a, a subordinate couldn't challenge a superior officer if they're doing something wrong. Now you say you've tweaked your policy that you can actually do that. And subordinates gets particularly if it's something really blatant that you're violating somebody's basic constitutional rights. Is that what you're alluding to? That's that's exactly what it is. You are required. You are required to do it. You are required to intervene, and you're required to notify your supervisor as soon as you're done. Good. You are required to do it. Yes, and, and you're right. So the other thing that that I think what came out of the, the George Floyd is a need for more conversations in the community. So myself and a few other people, we put together a program that we go around and teach. It's called What to Do If You Stop by Law Enforcement. And it's a very good conversation because it looks at interaction from a law enforcement standpoint and from a community standpoint. And we talk about different cases, Tamir Rice, George Floyd, um, all these different cases across the nation, but we talk about it from beginning to the end. Because sometimes what happens in the minority community is we want to skip to the end and say, well, you know, that cop was wrong. Okay, let's back up and let's look at the entire situation and see what could have been done different. And it's amazing to see when we have these conversations um, how some people don't think like, what we're thinking as a law enforcement officer. Well, why can't I keep my hands in my pocket? Or why can't I, why do I have to roll my window down if I got tinted windows, you know? 
Or why can't I just lean over and grab stuff out my glove box? So it's having those critical conversations. And I think that has really opened up the eyes of a lot of people. And I've had a lot of people say, we need more of these critical conversations. That's what I vow to do is have them across Douglas County. Good. Well, I know in years when I used to do table talking events in the community, it was always a challenge, but also at the end of the day, when we did evaluations, people enjoyed opportunities to talk and engage with folks who were different from them or right. from different occupations. And I learned that years ago doing community forums, probably have the Guinness World Records of doing community forums in a nonprofit in North Omaha. Uh, but again, it comes back to bringing in experts or bringing in professionals or bringing in grassroots or grass top and letting them talk. Uh, in recent years, I noticed that the city and county is becoming more diverse. Um, and what would what would what would we offer you offer those that you would offer as a person of color that other candidates may not offer the community, and particularly when we have a disproportionate number of people of color in the criminal justice system. So, what will you bring to the table that the other ones may not bring? That's a that's an excellent question. Well, I tell you what I'm looking at right now. It seems sometimes that when these uh, programs happen in the city, people forget about the county. You know, they forget about that I have a hundred, well, 90 something thousand population out in the county. And then if you add in the rural, the Bennington, your Waterloo Valley, Ralston, you add in those jurisdictions, we're over a hundred thousand in population. So they have all these social programs for the city but they leave the county, the other part of the county out. So I know that we have a disproportionate number of minorities in the criminal justice system. So what I did was I took the initiative and I started having conversations about restorative justice, okay? And that is something that I'm working on right now. I'm going to have a pilot program just for um, Douglas County. And then I want to see that expanded across Douglas County. The problem I got with the criminal justice system is this, and I think that's why we have so many disproportionate minorities in the criminal justice system, is it's, you have to go to the system, you have to plead, and then you can look at some type of diversion program. That's the problem I got, because with restorative justice, you do that on the front end. So you do everything you need to do, you type up like a law enforcement officer, if we have a victim and we have a suspect and they're both willing to do it, we type it up, we don't send it to the criminal justice system. We can take make two copies of it. One goes to a mediation center. The mediation center will look at call both in. They'd have mediation between the two, have some counseling, have some talking. I like that because they look at the suspect and say, what was going on in your life that you committed this crime? What service can we provide? But at the same time, how can we still hold you accountable for your actions? Now, one thing about our criminal justice system sometimes, it forgets about the victim. Well, restorative justice, it doesn't. That's why it's called restorative justice because it looks at the victim. How can we make you whole again, okay? It's not just fixing your window or you know replacing the items that were stolen from your house. You felt violated. What do you wanna say to the person who violated you or do you wanna say anything? So they give both of them services. So you have services, services and accountability. Now, if, if the suspect follows through, the paperwork is never filed with the wow. criminal justice system. Now, what's gonna happen? Now, here's that ripple effect. If the paperwork's never filed with the criminal justice system, that person never goes in the system. Now, if that person never goes in the system, you're gonna see that the cases in our criminal justice drop which means you're gonna see less people getting convicted of crimes and going to Lincoln. If you have less people going to our state facilities, that means that overcrowding that we have right now, you won't have that. So then those individuals that are in our criminal justice system, now they can do programming. They can't do programming right now because it's too crowded and they can't get them to these places. So if they get, now stats show us that 90 something percent of those individuals that are convicted and when they are released they return to the zip code in which they committed the crime personally i rather have the the time in the facility that they can have meaningful programming so when they return to our community they return as productive citizens now me 
I, I would love to be the sheriff that's sitting there. And when that person gets off that bus or gets out that car, shake their hand and say, welcome back to the community. You have served your time. Okay. You have done your time. Now I need you to be a productive citizen. That's what I need from you. You know, as you say that, uh, oftentimes people confuse the concept of criminal justice and juvenile justice. And in juvenile justice, it is almost Im imperative that you look at it from, I would say, uh, um, restorative area or even rehabilitation. We don't oftentimes see that in the criminal justice system, particularly nationally. And so what you're sharing is very key. The other thing is, is we haven't put enough time in restorative justice activity. I've seen a number of videos over the years and back in the day, when I was a Catholic church, there was a great groundswell in certain areas of the country, and there were some here, but it dissipated because some agencies that were running with it dropped it. I mean, again, if you deal with catching people as they're going downstream, you can stop some of the craziness that goes on. And secondly, we spend an ordinary too much money on warehousing adults, uh, time out, as they would say. If you look at other countries across the globe, uh, they've done a much better job. Even with convicted felons, murderers, and so on, they tend to treat them in a much more humane manner, and they behave accordingly. And so not to say that there might be that 5 or 10% who's going to be habitually involved in the system, but you just alluded to the 90% who come back, and how do we make sure that they, they have loved ones and relatives and people? And so we got to do a better job of integrating that. I'm going to switch up a little bit and ask you, uh, you have been uh, going to a number of candidates for the North of Hall, I'm aware of that. Uh, what have you learned from your active campaigning? Uh, and this, I assume, is your first time running for an office like that. But share it with our viewing eyes a little bit more. What's that like for you? And particularly drill it down. I, again, I don't want to put you on front street, but what is it like running for office and also doing with some of the campaigns particularly in North of Hall? You know, it, it's been an eye-opening experience. I can tell you that right now. You're right. This is my first time. Um, running for an elected office, um, learning the ins and outs. I, I tell people all the time, and some, my managers say, don't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm not a politician. I am a professional law enforcement executive. If it was up to me, there would be no campaigning. All you could do is you take your resume two weeks before the election. <laughs> Everyone has to submit their resume to the uh, the paper, newspaper of that, that city. And then that's the only thing people can look at because some people make themselves out to be shiny and, and I'm this, that, and the other. And, <laughs> you know, and, and you look at it. I'll say this here, Ajmo, and, and I know you'll understand this. When I was growing up, I was always told that if you want to compete in this nation okay you have to get your education you have to uh get time on a job you have to get your training you have to do more than others to be seen as equal so i, I set myself out that way because if a job requirement asked for and i knew i wanted to be a police chief or a sheriff one day so most job requirements jobs uh, descriptions say a bachelor's degree required master's preferred so I got a master's. You know, they asked for you know so many years of command experience. I have typically five years of command experience. I have 10 years. So now that I got everything that society has asked me to, to get, I have one of my, uh, my uh, opponents saying, well, yeah, but you know what? Education really doesn't matter now. So, because <laughs> he doesn't have it. <laughs> So I'm like, well, why are we trying to change the rules now? Because this is the thing. Um, you show me a city that has a population of 95,000 that has 200 and, and have a police department that has 220 personnel, 140 sworn, that has a $20 million budget. Show me a police department or a mayor or city manager that would hire a police chief that don't have an education. Now, no education, we're saying. Right. So now what my what one of my opponents is saying is that we both have the same experience because we've both been on 26 years. And I want to make sure the audience knows that is not true. There is a difference, and I know you know this, between time and experience. <laughs> Big difference. We both have the same amount of time, 26 years, but my experience with each level that I went up in a chain of command there's different duties and responsibilities 
and different experiences. So my his experience as a sergeant is totally different than my experience as a chief deputy. So I, I just kind of find that kind of funny. Well, the other thing that amazes me, and I can say this very bluntly, having been in an academic arena and a practitioner as a practice in the community, is that both of them can be very helpful. And I find it sad some of these neophytes who want to run for office have never accomplished some things they want to be or want to do. And so if you don't know how to read the book and finish your chapter, it's like when I do the book discussion, there are some people who log on and they have never read the book, so they can contribute to the topic from a coherent manner. They talk of generalities and get off the topic. And the same thing with education. You know, I find it strange. I remember years ago, Bob Armstrong made a statement that when he was given the scholarships out, he had went to the person who had the highest GPA or he went to some empirical reason versus this nepotism stuff that happens in our community or friends of the system. So it's very important to say there's a difference between someone who formally pursues education. Again, I don't want to be against people like Malcolm X or people who are right. self-taught or self uh, spend a lot of time learning on their own. But I do know there is something about having, as you use the term experience, uh, Wayne, that we need to be bringing into consideration because we can't send our third string quarterback into the Super Bowl, especially when no. we got first string quarterbacks who know the history of our community and know what we need. And again, it's like when I'm teaching a family's class and some students want to challenge me on childhood and, I, and how you raise kids and I ask the question, have you ever raised any kids? No, well, in the <laughs> conversation. You know, again, there's a difference between being a father, uh, our mother, our parent, our guardian, and having that responsibility or someone who's read it in the book. So I hear you clearly, and that's something we got to push back at because some people think that these recent uh, incidents or situations qualify them as experts on our culture and history. And one of the things I was going to ask you about, during the 360 meetings, you explained, and I remember this in a particular meeting where I was the one who always asked the question of law enforcement, so Ajamal's name's in the room and it hangs there because I'm going to ask you the question. But you explained the difference between the racial diversity in Douglas County Sheriff Department as contrast to Op Omaha Public uh, Police Department. Explain that a little bit more. What does that mean in terms of you talk about the test, the TN or something like that versus right. you guys in top three. Explain that more to our viewing audience. Okay, so our hiring process is governed by Nebraska State statute. In a nutshell, that, that statute says this, for every one position, the sheriff can only consider the top three individuals on an eligibility list, okay? So the first thing we do is we do a entry level test. They take that test and then whatever score they get on that test, we put that on a spreadsheet. And then we do a interview. First of all, they have to get high enough to get an interview, okay? And then we take their interview score and average it with their test score. And then we come with an eligibility list. All right, so then let's say I'm hiring one person. I can only look at the top three names. Well, that's extremely hard to diversify your department when you only have a handful of minorities and females that are applying for the agency. So that's called the rule of three. The reason why they have that is because years ago, when the new sheriff was elected, they would take over office and fire everyone. <laughs> so they bring their own people in. So now with this rule of three, so it's extremely difficult because I tell people like this, Chief Tom Warren, if he decided to take my test the next time we test, and let's say he takes the test, and let's just say he had a bad day taking the test that day, okay, and he came in fourth, and I had one position open, and the three ahead of him had just a GED, just GED, and no law enforcement experience. The way this, this law is, I cannot, if I have no reason to skip those three, I have to hire one of them. Chief Warren does not get consideration. Wow. That's mind boggling. I mean, it's very clear how you explain it, but most right. people don't know that. And I remember that in a 360 meeting, I do have to give a shout out that from time to time, you know, I've picked up some things that hopefully will help our community in sharing that. Uh, well, and, and go let ahead. me say this here. So I'm all police. They don't have that rule. So the Chief Schmatter, what he can do is he can, he works with the Black Police Office Association and because they do a lot of recruiting, they do a lot of training, and then they encourage these individuals to take the test. So then what he can do is he can look at his test and say, okay, uh, let me have uh, five African-Americans, let me have five Latinos, let me have 10 women. And he can go anywhere on his list that he wants to, okay? We can't do that. We can't do it. And that's why I'm asking Senator Wayne, and he's supposed to introduce a bill this next session where, he knows that it's a state law, 
So it'd be hard for him to throw that out, but he can tweak it just for cities of a certain metropolitan size, Omaha, okay? And that law will say the rule of three times how many positions you have open if your department does not reflect the diversity of your community based on your latest census. So I can show that in Douglas County, it's 11% African-American. I can show that 4% is on my department. So then I can go to my merit commission and say, based on my numbers, I would like to use the rule of three times how many people I have I'm hiring for. So wow. right now, if I'm hiring 10 people, I can look at the top 30 on the list. The probability of having a female or a minority in top 30 is better. Now, I'm gonna say this, and I know some of my colleagues will, will scream, and I'll say it again. We will never sacrifice quality for quantity, but no one can tell me there's a major difference between someone scoring a 98 on a, on a total list and someone scoring a 92, because it comes down to that. Sometimes we only go down to like the 94, someone sc the individual score 94. But if I can go down to 92, 90, now I like the federal system. The federal, once you take the test, they lump everyone. If you score 100 to 90, then you are highly qualified, right? There's no more rank order. They grab anyone out of that category. Wow. You know, it reminds me of when I was teaching in Amer uh, Nebraska Methodist College, and we had this concept of nursing and graduation and test scores and the way the nursing exam was, you, all you needed was a 75. So whether you got a 99 or a 75, you were still in the pool. And some people couldn't comprehend that concept. And it's almost like sometimes I'd rather have a person who's much more balanced. And I have had people who work for me who even interviewed that they would get us killed because they didn't have common sense or they didn't have the basic wherewithal. And the other thing that many of us work in, particularly in short uh, in fields where we're short staff, you want flexibility. Because if somebody doesn't show up one day, you got to have to multitask and do that. And so you want to keep the shop running. And so unfortunately, sometimes our people are so myopic or provincial or narrow minded that they don't understand some people are better at tests than others. But at the end of the day, what we want folks who's going to be able to make those critical decisions under adverse conditions that can help save lives or help our community. And too often we don't have that in many of these institutions that are so empirically based that they fail to look at other factors uh, such as lived experience can help us out. I, I, the other thing I was gonna ask you, and I think uh, in recent years, we've seen various administrations and law enforcement require those academic degrees. What are the more significant uh, accomplishments that formal education can do for you in law enforcement that one will not, and you alluded to it earlier, but what are some of those other areas that you see as a, the tipping point, as we would say, uh, in this kind of work? Well, when it comes to having a formal education, um, typically what we're going to find is someone who has some lived experiences because they've been to college. They have um, the ability to start a task, complete a task. They have ability. You have to be able to write and speak um, to be a good law enforcement officer. And that's what we typically find. And there was a study I had seen a while back, and I need to try to find it again, that showed that law enforcement officers who had a degree had less uses of force. Mm. I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting because we're talking about critical thinking. Um, I know that we have some law enforcement officers, I know for a fact, that they're quick to use muscle and use, you know, uh, threatening techniques versus de-escalation techniques. Uh, I, I always say this, and this is something that I definitely will be um, tweaking uh, when I become sheriff is we train the most for what we use the least, the oh. most guns, bullets, tactics. We train a lot, but when it comes to de-escalation, when it comes to verbal judo, verbal skills, well, there's a quick little class in it, they were gone. Um, I can tell you right now from spending 14 years at the Douglas County Courthouse, I have taught my way out of more situations. I've talked down more people than I have used force. My thing is this, if I can talk you down, then we both are fine. I don't have to get, you no, know, wrestle you, I don't have to do paperwork. You know, I'm gonna tell you how it's gonna be. We're gonna have a conversation. 
you either going to listen or not. Now, I'm not going to raise my voice. I'm not going to, you know, uh, go all crazy. My mentor has a good saying. He says, um, um, when I view the video, it should be abundantly clear who is my trained professional. Wow. When I have a situation in my agency and I view the video, I should be seeing my deputy saying, sir, please do this. Ma'am, please do this. <laughs> if you do not, this is what's going to happen. Explain to them. Tell them what's going to happen. Tell them again. Act. You know, don't jump all the way to, all to force. Use your verbal skills. But I think what's going on is, and I, I know this, is that we're getting this younger generation and this talking, that's not what they're used to. They're used to this. Right. So we got to get away from it and say, no, this isn't what we're going to be doing. We got to be able to verbalize. We got to be able to talk. And you got to be able to talk to a CEO of a, of a company and a person who's down on their luck and right. everybody in between. And you Thanks should be able to switch and be able to communicate. You know, it's funny you mentioned because there's two. I started laughing because I was thinking about when I was a freshman in college Sorry, in Lincoln. Uh, the point in the just hold on, just a second. I was in Lincoln and I was um, a freshman, and I remember the first semester, first month or so, I got three speeding tickets, and I was so angry. Uh, and one of them was from a helicopter where I made a U turn on campus. But one that I never forgot was I got stopped on Vine Street, and I was probably about 27th and Vine. I remember it very well. The police officer got out and he was so kind and courteous. He was freaking me out. And he kept calling me, sir. And, blah, blah, blah. and then after he gave me the ticket, I said, thank you. And I'm saying, something's wrong with this picture. This police officer just gave me a ticket and I thanked him. And I shared that story over the years that it was something about the way he approached me, how he behaved. And I, I still can't find out. I can't figure out why I thanked him for the ticket. I ended up paying for it and everything and all that. But it was like one of the pleasant experience of dealing with law enforcement because I was so used to the other side growing up in Omaha and so on. And I share that because that stuck with me. And I know that, again, over the years, I've met some officers who have a sense of respect for people. And again, I haven't been in contact with a lot of them because I've not been in certain areas. But my point is, I never forgot that one officer in Lincoln because he was one of the most curious officers and so on. And again, it goes back to what you just said. And that, I tell you what, I, I'm willing to bet that individual went to specific training I read something a while back, and I'm a firm, firm believer in this. And your story just brings home the point. A negative situation doesn't have to have a negative outcome. Right. And by the way, there's a situation. Yeah, your negative situation was you got a ticket, but it doesn't have to have an outcome where you hate law enforcement. The guy was kind. He was nice. He was courteous. He gave you a ticket. You thanked him. It's like, you know what? All right. I, I don't feel like I was disrespected. Right. I don't feel like he talked down to me. You know what? I, I'll take this ticket, you know? Right, right. And I guess the part of the issues is when you give out tickets, for some people, the issue is fairness and how well you do it. And again, I went through some of that defensive training. One officer said, if you're close to your house, you do the California stop, I may not give you a ticket. Or if you're within five miles over the speed limit, I may not give you a ticket. So there are some times where people can be very courteous about it. And I do remember one woman or one man, people told me they were on the way to church and they were speeding a little bit. And the officer was so nice to them. And they remember the officer's name and told me the story. And years later, when I met the officer in some of my circles, uh, I told him the story. He was somewhat laughing, but because he, he says, yeah, well, sometime on Sunday mornings and, you know, giving people tickets at the church because uh, they're over parked, you got to be sensitive to some people's culture and so on. But yeah, oh, yeah. very important. I, another question I want to gonna ask you is if, you know, we're getting close to the end. If you were elected chief of Douglas County Sheriff, what would you specifically bring to the officer change that others would not for that position? Well, I tell you right now, the one thing, well, a couple of things that I would bring is the uh, the wealth of knowledge that I have with this agency. Again, I've been with the agency for 26 years. There is no learning curve. There is no learning on the job. Everything that I need to start on day one, ready on day one, I already have, okay? For example, I have my formal education. I have already been sworn in as the sheriff because whenever uh, Sheriff Wheeler is absent, we have to have a continuity of uh, operations. So 
I can fill in, I can sign documents, everything as the sheriff of Douglas County in his, in his absence. So I have my top secret clearance, my federal clearance. That's critically important because there are times where we have to go to our federal partners and get a briefing on what's going on on a local level and on a national level, then bring that back to my command staff, what I can tell them, and to better protect our community. I am the only one who has that top secret clearance. Now, some of the other candidates say, well, I can get one. And, and uh, well, okay, prove it. You know, if, if you were a in a position where you were a, uh, a higher rank and the acting chief at times, why don't you have your federal clearance? Especially if other people with your position, in your position, and since you've left, have theirs, why didn't you have yours? So what I bring to them, to the county is, there is no learning curve. The county will not see any change in their law enforcement service. Now, what they will see is an intentional act of getting more involved in the community, more community forums, uh, more programming, uh, more outreach. That is what they'll see. The sheriff department will be open for business and I'll let everybody know, everyone will be treated fair and everyone will be treated equal. And everyone has a fair chance at employment. Which is good. You know, we're getting to the last one, but I want to throw a little point in. Years ago when I was hosting a community forum, <coughs> one of the participants came to the door and they went outside, I guess, and they smoked a cigarette. Then they got to an argument with uh, one of the staff members. In other words, there were some words exchanged. There was no profanity. And at some point, the staff member who was important to me wanted to eject that person because they were challenging them or somewhat, you know, in, in a conversation in the community. <laughs> and what came down to was a, the leader of the, of the site or the director. I had to say, no, unless the person broke a protocol of their own time, we got another man. If they were to cuss you out, it would be a different story. But we have to follow the rules. And most people know that. So that's what we got to deal with. We're down to our last uh, question. Uh, Wayne, uh, Chief Jeffrey, Sheriff Hudson, do you have any closing comments for our viewing audience? Well, I'll say um, that I love this profession. I do. Um, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to reading up on this profession. What I do is I read the, um, the federal um, books on when they do an investigation of a city and they put them on a consent decree, I read those. I do. I find them fascinating to find out what put a city law enforcement agency um, in a position where the federal government has to come in and investigate them. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One, because you know, I'm kind of a geek that way. And the other thing is, so I can make sure that my department avoids those pitfalls. Okay. Um, the other thing is this, I think there's a misconception when it comes to law enforcement. And this is one thing I'm gonna make sure that I'll be pushing out there. A lot of people think that there's two sides of law enforcement. There's a guardian and there is a warrior. Now, what I, what I need to get across to these younger uh, generation is quit watching TV. <laughs> TV is just a snippet. Quit watching TV. They come in this job thinking that it's all, um, you know, warrior, warrior, warrior. That's why, again, we train the most for what for we have the least. I, if you type in right now, law enforcement training, where well, you're going to see bullets, guns, tactics, very little verbal judo. So I tell one thing I'm going to get across these young deputies is that there's two sides, guardian and warrior. 98% of this job is guardianship. 98%. 2% is warrior. 98% guardian service. If you don't have a service heart, if you don't have a service mindset, this is not the career for you. Now, the other thing that I'll be doing too is, as uh, the sheriff, is in the academy, this came up through my, you asked this question before, and I'm going to bring this around. What would I do different? In the academy, I'm going to bring in different people from our community, different cultures, uh, so that they can sit down and talk about culture in their community and what to expect because we have a very diverse community and you need to understand some of the cultures and some of the norms 
um, so that you can really relate to these individuals. So that's another thing that I would do. The other thing that I'm going to do within the first 90 days is I'm going to have a sheriff, citizen, uh, action committee made up of individuals throughout Douglas County. Now, I don't want the same old, you know, leaders that we have. No, <laughs> I want individuals from the barbershop. I want individuals from the gas station. I want individuals that are in the seat in the boardroom, but I want to every so often, I want to bring these individuals together and we're going to talk about policies and procedures. We're going to talk about what's going on in the community because it's critically important to get the community input because right. if we're going to have a policy and procedures that's going to have a, an effect on the community, then the community should have some input. The other thing what that committee is helpful for is if I have a controversial shooting or something, I can't just you know, contact everyone, but I can contact that committee, let them know what I can let them know and let them spread the word. So that is to me, that is being inclusive of the committee, of the, of the community. Now, I, I really think that's important so that the entire community have a stake in the sheriff's office. Now we may not always agree, um, I may put a policy out there, but I think it's important. Diversity is important. I'm going to tell you this story here. Um, you, we, we have to have diversity because with diversity comes diversity of thoughts and ideas. It makes us a lot better agency. The uh, civilian world, when it comes to corporate world, they've known that for years. Law enforcement is just starting to catch on to that, that we have to diversify if we're going to be better. I was at a conference not too long ago, and this gentleman was trying to sell me a, a, this device. And I said, okay, um, what is it? He said, well, it will help you with individuals that run and individuals that have mental health issues. I said, okay. He said, uh, well, we have these 40 millimeter cannon guns that shoot bean bags out, but we've had those for years. He said, but this is a new device. It's the same type of gun, but inside packed in is a net. So you got somebody running from you, you shoot this net above the head, it flies out and it wraps them up. I'm going to say, no, I don't think we're going to be buying that. He said, oh, well, why not? Yeah, I mean, this is a great deal. I said, no, I said, think about this. I said, um, um, how's that going to look with my African-American community if I'm going to shoot this net out? I said, that reminds me of slavery. I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? The other thing, diversity. When we had the riots and the civil unrest uh, a couple of years back, um, I was the, the commander of it. So we get all the information on what we're going to deploy and then you know, I see the plan and it has our canine dogs on it. I said, um, what's this? And they said, well, you know, we want the canine out there. I said, no, no, we're not doing that. Well, you know, it's part of our, our equipment. I said, no, I said, I tell you what, you can bring the dogs, but you only take them out if it's a life or death situation or I specifically authorize it. Again, diversity. I think back to the civil rights era when they have the dogs out there, but you gotta be thinking about that. But if you don't have anyone in these seats, who's gonna think about that? I know Lincoln, they had the dogs out there. Why someone didn't step up and say, hey, this is not a good look. You don't need dogs to control a riot situation. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, I really appreciate it because I think that's part of the challenge we face in other occupations, whether it be child welfare, criminal justice, law and lawyers, you know, medicine. If you don't look at the context of people's history, and again, we look at Tuskegee as an example in the medical field, you got to build those relationships. We really appreciate that. So Chief yeah. Deputy Sheriff Hudson, we really appreciate you being with us today on uh, more as we deal with throwing down some heavy light and hope you can join us again. And we look forward to maybe talking to you after the election oh, to yeah. get your insight also. So thanks for being with us today. And uh, we hope you have a good evening. As we always end, may the force be with you and Barocco. <laughs>